I'm not a doctor. I don't play one on TV. I certainly don't play one in the role of sports writer. However, I do feel comfortable in saying, or at least suggesting, that Tristan Jari should be the starting goaltender in tonight's Game 6. Easy for me to say, right? Good morning to you. Good Friday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is Daily Shot of Penguins, and it comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into football and or baseball. I also offer Daily Shots of Steelers and Pirates where you found this. Game 6 is at PPG Paints Arena. It has a 7.10 p.m. faceoff. And a few minutes before that, if things go as I think they might, Ryan Mill, the PA announcer over there, is going to belt out that the starting goaltender is Tristan Jari. How do I know this? Well, the easy answer to that is I don't. Why do I think this? It's because two things surprised me. One of them was two mornings ago at Madison Square Garden. Tristan Jari was out on the ice with Andy Kyoto, the goaltending coach, and Ty Hennis, the skills coach. That's it. They were the only three people on the rink. And they were going through what looked to be the softest possible set of drills you've ever seen for a goalie. Jari seemed, seemed, I say, and keep that in mind, to be moving kind of gingerly in the crease. When he'd get up, he seemed cautious. And I'm sitting in the first row against the glass there, where not only can I see everything that they're doing, really clear view, but also, you know, hear a lot of what they're talking about. And everything's just, how's this? How's that? Try this. Try that. And then Kyoto would kind of back off. And then Hennis, who's out there to shoot pucks, he's shooting them. And he's a skills coach, so he's actually got some skills. So he knows where to shoot and where not to shoot on a goaltender who is hurt. And in Jari's case, coming off a broken foot. Now, shooting low and shooting on the foot is one thing. What I was looking for was seeing whether or not he could dig in. You know, you know those when you see just after the anthem, when goaltenders are doing that thing in the crease where they're sliding left, right, it looks like some kind of a folk dance, okay? But they're digging their skates in up against their pipes. That's really planting. That's putting your full violent body weight onto that foot. That wasn't really happening. He was doing a little bit of it. He was doing a little bit. Of so anyway, long story short, I think there's just no chance. I don't think he's in the solar system of doing anything. And then I see the rest of the, the, the so the ice gets cleaned and everybody leaves, all three of these guys. And after it's 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 all smooth and everything else, the players, the rest of the players who were going to participate in that optional came out and Jari's still sitting there. What's he doing here? Huh. Okay. Well, before long, I see Andy Kyoto come back out. And then I see uh, Dr. Vias come out. He's the, the, the team's you know, main medical guy. And I see different people talking to different people. And then I see Andy Kyoto goes back on the rink, skates over next to Jari. Now he starts talking to him a little bit more. So can I read into this and presume that all of this was unscheduled or unexpected? I don't know. I don't know, but I'm just sharing this with you. Next thing you know, Jari's in net. And Alex Dorio, who'd been Louis Domingue's backup, is in the other net. And Jari's taking the same shots. Mercy free. Guys were just coming in and letting it rip because that's kind of what hockey players do. And through all this, Jari's got this great big smile on his face. So if he's in some kind of discomfort, he's also the world's greatest actor in this moment. After that session, Mike Sullivan used the term big step to describe what had just occurred out there on the rink. And then yesterday, on what was a day off for the team, Sullivan had this to say to reporters regarding Jari's status 
for the weekend. Well, he just has to continue to go through the rehab process until uh, our medical staff and our, uh, our rehab department uh, deems him ready to, to, to return to play. So he's making significant progress. We're really encouraged, and uh, we'll take each day as it comes. Hmm. What do you think of that? This portion of Daily Shot of Penguins is brought to you by the good people at the Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank, where they're committed to providing food for all of our neighbors in need across Western Pennsylvania. They, in turn, need your help. Find out how $1 can be turned into five full meals for those in need. Visit pittsburghfoodbank.org. Here's what I know. Sullivan, as... Much as he attempts and usually succeeds at keeping injury information to himself, has so many easily telegraphed signals in one direction or the other because he uses the same or similar code words depending on the situation. One tendency that he's had since he's been here is that when there's a player who is close to coming back or closer to coming back than what most of us would seem to think, he'll speak just like what you heard before the break there. He'll say, very encouraged, really uplifting to see. And he also sometimes, please don't misinterpret this, okay? But he'll also sometimes throw a little bit of a hint that it would be okay if this player came back. Now, sometimes he'll do that in a negative connotation, and it's pretty obvious, like this this dude just needs to get back to playing. And other times it's going to be legit. And honestly, I don't know or care which it is. I have no doubt that Tristan Jari has a broken foot, and I have no doubt that there aren't uh, any amount of millions of dollars that would get me to go play a hockey game with (laughs) A broken foot, never mind an elimination Stanley Cup playoff game. And on top of that, to repeat, Jari looks as if he's the one pushing this process as well. So there could just be a mutual understanding. Now, that said, Jari's going to have to have the morning skate of a lifetime today to get himself ready for game six. But if he isn't ready for game six, if that's how this turns out, um, you're going to see him in game seven in New York. And I strongly suspect you'll see other guys who've been missing. And that's going to be a very, very big deal for this hockey team, whether it's tonight or whether there is, in fact, another game Sunday. When we come back, just one question. And today's J1Q comes from Mike, who asks, DK, what hit on Sid do you think was worse? The cross-check from Matt Niskanen or the Truba hit? Mike, I, I, I don't know that I've seen one on Sid that was worse than Niskanen's. And I say that on so, so, so many levels. Because Niskanen took his stick into Sid's mouth, I mean, right into his face at the side of the Washington net there. And if you're doing that, you just don't have any care whatsoever about injuring, disfiguring, uh, damaging the life of another human being that that one goes so far beyond the pale even if those two weren't teammates for an extended period in Pittsburgh and i can tell you this you know how after every playoff series uh, 
teams will shake hands and you'll say, oh, that's so great. They're so sportsmanlike and they don't hold any grudges. It's all just part of the game. It isn't always just part of the game. What Niskanen did to Sid with those two having had a relationship as teammates in Pittsburgh, and Niskanen was a pretty well-liked guy when he was here. He could be a little ornery, a little unusual, but it was always in the cause of the team or defending or protecting someone uh, or their reputation or who they are inside the room. It was never just because, you know, you know, he was a jerk or something. He, he wasn't. This so far and away crossed the line of anything that would be de- deemed uh, reasonable or within the game. And I can tell you that Sid did not overlook that one. How shall I word it without going too far here? That was not a bridge that was going to be mended. That's something that was so so far outside anything that anyone at all on the Pittsburgh side of it was never going to look past it. The guys who had been here, the Chris Kunitzes, the you know the the longer term Penguins, were never ever ever going to let that go because you're just betraying a, a, a trust that runs a lot deeper than the game. So. You can see here that I'm not about to compare this to Truba. I do believe very strongly, as I made clear on the show yesterday from New York, that Gerard Gallant, while not exactly putting out a a call for a hit or a bounty or something silly like that, made sure that he pushed the right buttons so that the right players, that's mostly Truba on that team, we're going to take their runs. We're going to strike the fear of God into the Penguins' best players. You can say that. You can get that point across without saying, hey, by the way, the next time you see Sidney Crosby skating in your direction, be sure to raise your elbow up in a chicken wing formation and cut him off. Make sure that he goes down. You don't have to do that. You just have to give him some kind of look before the game, you know, like movie style, just walk past his stall, make eye contact. Something like that. Truba takes the hint, goes out there, tries to hit Jake Gensel the same way, but with the other arm. I guess the NHL didn't bother even looking at that one. It was worse than the one on Sid. The only difference with the Sid one was that it did the damage. Look, I got to tell you, you know, I said on yesterday's show that the league was going to do nothing. The league did nothing. I don't even know if the league looked at it. I said on yesterday's show that they were going to be influenced by the complete lack of attention given to this by the New York media. And in fact, the only real mention of the incident in any significant New York publication came in the New York Times. Where the Times acknowledged that the hit was dirty, the Times acknowledged that the hit changed the course of the game. But you didn't get that from any of the other ones up there, and you certainly weren't going to get it from their TV partners. And thus, the NHL was comfortable in protecting the assailant. That's what they do. And that's also what the NHL Players Association does. And see, here I go again. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. The NHL did nothing. It's over. We'll see if and when Sid returns to this series. We'll certainly know a lot more at this eventful morning skate that's coming up later today. But one way or another, let's not act surprised in our indignance by what happened here, either on the ice or off the ice. From the Penguins' perspective, they'd better not be thinking about this. They'd better not. They have a game to win. And they're not going to do that by looking around wistfully for number 87. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everyone listening to Daily Shot of Penguins. If you're interested in, uh, you know, one of those emergency weekend editions of Daily Shot, uh, feel free to to let me know. But, you know, I'm going to ask you a favor in return. You need to go to Apple Podcasts and make sure that you leave us a nice, happy five-star review or whatever it is that they ask for. Uh, that makes a big, big difference in the algorithm and how many people get to hear this show. 
Um, and if you do all that and you're really nice and, and you're not Jacob Truba, we'll have another one of these tomorrow.